Okay, um, I want to talk about two different things in um, performing 19th century music. It's certainly the first half of the 19th century. Um, one thing is changes to the score. You were expected to make changes to the score. I'll get into that in a minute. And the other is harmonic analysis. Now, um, Aguado published a method in 1843, and uh, Tecla published an English translation of it. And uh, he gives a bar by Fernando Thor, and then a few variations goes over the page, um, detailing various options you have for playing that bar, and uh, five different ways, and. It's the same for every bar. They were expected to decorate and ornament the scores. Aguado went on to publish an entire solo by Saur in his own version, how he would play it. Um, also, quite a few of the composers talked about preludes, improvising preludes to pieces which I didn't do this time, but I have done an, a number of videos in the past. Um, so we lived in a, or they lived in a, an era of uh, improvisation. And all the players were composers themselves. And a lot of the compositions were born out of improvisations. Um, so it's something we should think seriously about. Um, I started about, I don't know how many years ago, 12, 15 years ago, I wrote uh, a couple of essays on it for my website, and I've made a number of videos where I, I say I do improvise preludes, but also cadenzas, a little breaks in the piece somewhere. I don't always do it, but I enjoy doing it, I do it sometimes. And I try to every day have a little bit of improvisation in the 19th century style in my playing. So let's go. I'm just going to concentrate on the first line and the last line of the piece. Uh, now, the score is published by Tecla. Um, you can f I'll give a link below to essays on my website um, about in interpreting this music. And um, I'll talk you through the first line. You may remember the first, it started with just these chords. G7 flat 9 chord. Okay, now a simple, you know, we talk about improvisation and you get scared, but it, it could be a very, very simple thing. So instead of playing block chords, I arpeggiate them. line in the tenor voice it's just a little something and it helps the cadence move along uh, just briefly on the next line I, I bring in some pizzicato uh, by putting my, the palm, uh, palm muting if you like there were different types of pizzicato at the time another one was just to just take your left hand fingers off all the wrong notes there. It's kind of staccato style, uh, but I used palm meeting on that. Now fast forward to the last line, um, we had these uh, chords, <laughs> which end on a, a, D7, a G7 with a D in the bass. And I use that as a kicking off point for a little cadenza. Now, cadenzas are usually, we think of them in terms of orchestral um, uh, performances where there might be a violin concerto or something. That at one point, the orchestra would stop, the violinist would run up and down scales and arpeggios showing off, or if they're more musical, commenting on the, the piece that they've been working on. And then the orchestra comes back in and there's a big hurrah at the end. Um, well, it doesn't need to be that grand. Uh, just in a, a small piece like this, 
Um, even a minuet, even a dance, you can stop the dance, have a little bar or two, something, uh, just to... Um, uh, it's on the repeat, you know, I do it on the repeats. Now, I don't know if it's historically accurate to only do changes on the repeats. I doubt it. They probably did changes all the time, all the way through. But it's sometimes nice to hear the, um, the first time through a section uh, as written and then the second time through with a few additions. Um, I quite like that. Uh, but in this piece, uh, I've reached a, the G7. What could I do? I could do a G7 arpeggio from the bottom. And then come in into the rest of the piece. It's a little bit boring, uh, but I could do that. I could change a dominant 7th chord into a dominant 7th flat 9 chord, which happened a lot in this period, so I love doing that. And um, uh, in fact, he does it in this piece, but it, that means instead of starting on G7, I'm going to start on A flat. And it's the equivalent of a, a diminished seventh scale, or an arpeggio. Into that uh, A flat chord that comes in. Um, what I did at the time was um, uh, I did a, a downwards descending arpeggio of the um, dominant seventh flat nine of chords, and then from here I did a little chromatic thing. done chromatics up here. Um, let's see. So that's a bit more Giuliani, I think, than saw. Very Giuliani concerto type of thing. But anyway, I did what I did, and uh, you could do something different. Um, or nothing at all. You don't have to do this. Um, so that was uh, additions to the score, changes to the score, um, and each performer should do their own thing. Um, next thing is harmonic analysis. I want to do this because every single note within the piece has its place within a harmonic framework. And you might like to think this is just a bunch of random notes that actually somehow sound great together. Um, but the reality is, um, Sora was working in a tradition, and there were various cliched phrases that people used, just as they are in blues and jazz and pop and rock today. Um, and so it's good to know what they are. And if you know what every single note in the piece means, <laughs> then you can go out to an audience with a bit more confidence. Uh, you can really know the piece inside out. Um, even if the audience is just your teddy bear, as often happens with me. <laughs> um, so we start, it's in C minor. Now C minor is not uh, a popular key on the guitar. There's not a huge amount of pieces in C minor. Um, so I like to know the lay of the land and the fretboard of all the chords that are in the key of C minor. Based on two scales, the harmonic minor for harmonies and the natural minor with that B flat, which is in the key signature. Um, but you'll notice a few B naturals, the accidental signs throughout the piece, and that's for the harmonic minor scale. Okay, now when I'm analyzing uh, music, I phone up. Johann Sebastian Bach for help. Yes, I've got Bach's phone number and it's 1473-6251. 1473-6251. Now, memorize Bach's phone number because it is very helpful. Um, now let's look at 
C minor, and let's go through Bach's phone number um, in the key of C minor. So we have one, four, seven, three. So that's chord one, C minor. Chord four is F minor. Um, seven is uh, B diminished, and then uh, three is E flat. Or this. And then A flat, or this, um, two five one. That's the, that's the sixth chord. Six two five one six two, which is D minor seven flat five. It's on the inner four strings, and the, the frets are five six five six. And then G seven, which in the minor key, often has a flat nine on it. That's an A flat. G, a G7 chord, and then one again. So let's go through that one, four, seven, three, six, two, five, one. I put the flat nine on the G7 on the air. It's a bit dissonant. That's uh, it's very often on top, and it's in this piece. So that's kind of the lay of the land of uh, the, the harmonies that might be used. Of course, there will be uh, changes of key going other places. So let's look at it. C minor, chord one, chord six, A flat, chord one. Now this is chord two, but in a first inversion. Remember chord two was D minor seven flat five. The notes are D, A flat, C, F. Now, first inversion, we start on the F. So we got F, C, D, if I do a bar, and A flat. Now, we've got three quarters of that in this chord. With four bars from the very end of the piece, you get the full chord. Two. So this is chord two. And then there's the G7. Flat on top, that's the flat nine. There's the seven, C minor, G7, C, so one five one at the end. Some pizzicato stuff, and then G7 with a D on the second string into C minor, some pizzicato stuff, G7. We expect C minor again, but we get A flat. Now it's a surprise, but not totally weird surprise. It's kind of tolerable surprise. And the reason is the C minor chord on strings two and three has an E flat and C, and the A flat chord has those two plus an A flat. So two out of three of the notes are the same in each chord. Um, so that's an, what's called an interrupted cadence. Um, and then comes in a very interesting chord. Now my ear tells me that's a kind of dominant seventh. So it could be A flat seven going to D flat, and that top note falls down. It's not a flat seventh. A flat seventh would be G flat, but it's A sharp. Now A sharp one going up the scale of A flat one two three four five six six sharp six augmented six. It's an augmented six interval, and this is called A flat augmented six. Now it's the same notes as A flat seven, but it functions differently. It no longer has the dominant chord function. So it's no longer going to go to D flat major. It's going to, this is going to go up the way. And the bass is going to go down. So we're going in contrary motion. Now, Saur loved these augmented six chords. One of the reasons is you can change 
key semitone down, for instance, uh, very quickly. If I was in the key of C major, and I had G7 as my dominant, which is an F on top, and the F falls down to an E on top of the C chord. And instead of calling that F, if I had wrote, if I'd written it out as um, E sharp, yes, you can get E sharp. Uh, despite what they tell in your first lesson, <laughs> and B sharp as well. So this is E sharp now on top of this G chord. Now E is six notes above G, so this is an augmented six. And remember it goes up the way, and the bass goes down. F sharp, seven, B. I've suddenly reached the key of B. Now I can do that very quickly. I'd want to get to the B, key of B by going around the cycle of fifths, it would take me a while. C, C sharp, F, uh, not C sharp, C, C7, F, F7, B flat, B flat 7, E flat, E flat 7, A flat, A flat 7, D flat, D flat 7, uh, G flat or F sharp. F sharp 7, I finally get to B. You know, it takes an age to get there. Whereas when you change a dominant 7 into a, um, an augmented 6 chord, very quick. So Summer loved these, and this is an instance of one. Sorry, I don't want to go on too long. When people study with me, of course, we go much slower, and we start with very simple pieces. And this is a bit more advanced, this piece. Um, I just want to give you an idea of what the thought processes that are going on and the compositional um, techniques that Saur is employing. In the B section, we have G7 to um, C a couple of times, and then this chord. Well, this is the same as this chord, the A flat uh, of meta 6. It's just the A flat in the bass is now on the 6th string. Also A flat augmented six and it goes down to G7. Okay. And then we go through a kind of cycle of fifths thing. Uh, G7 goes to C major. C7 goes to F minor. And then this remember this is the two chord. How do we change a two chord into a five chord by just changing one note? Well, this C becomes a B, and we have G7 flat 9. So, chord 2, D minor 7 flat 5, G7 flat 9. I usually finger it this way, and you'll note it looks like a diminished 7th chord. A diminished 7th chord every 3 frets. Right? It's the same notes each time. Amazing, you know, F, B, D, A flat, F, B, D, A flat, F, what did I say, B, uh, D, A flat, so on. It's always the same notes but in different dispositions. Uh, but it's not really a dominant, a diminished seventh, it's a dominant seventh with flat nine. You must remember that it's functioning as a dominant chord. Um, uh, so we get this, um, and this also is G7 flat 9, there's no G, the notes are F, A flat, B, you can imagine a G below it, interesting chord, it just, it's a dominant chord with a little bit more tension, so it's got more forward momentum it wants to resolve goes to C minor, G7, C minor, G7, C minor, same again, and then this chord, again it looks like a dominant 7, we take the first finger away, it looks like D7, which goes to G, so this could be D7 with a flat 9, that E flat, 
that's what it is. It's G7 because it's going to go to a and D7 is going to go to a G chord. There, and then it goes to G, but actually G7. And here is where I put the cadenza in. And from there on, Bach's phone number comes back. After the G7, we have 6251. Remember his phone number, 1473-6251. These are cycle of fourths. So we have 6, 2, 5, 1. combination chord. The, the the lowest note is C and that's the key of the piece. So you know, we're imagining C minors coming up. But the top two notes belong to G7. Um, so we've got the tonic and the dominant squashed up together, which re gets resolved into C minor. So there you have it. Um, we can alter the scores. Um, when we feel like uh, doing something to them and an analysis of the score can really give you uh, an, an insight into Fernando Sor's mind and uh, what he was doing manipulating this material um, his way and putting his stamp on it and it was very common material if you like um, but he could still manipulate it and tie it in with his emotions and uh, it's a sign of a good composer and Fernando Sor was a good composer. Harmonically I think he was the best of the early 19th century uh, musicians, uh, composers for the guitar and uh, you know it's good to study this stuff. Okay, hope you enjoyed that. Bye. <laughs>